Hi, we're Josh and Arielle Wamsley, owners of Green Valley Tree LLC, based in North Windham. We're proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week and to serve the communities of Windham and New London counties with our tree removal and plant health care services. Visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com for a full list of our services or give us a call on 860-234-4041. We look forward to hearing from you. It's one of the most talked about technologies of recent times, artificial intelligence and the effects it could have on humanity. We talked to Joe Nigro, a technology expert, to get his thoughts on the good and bad of AI. Plus, we take a look at other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott-Smith. It's become one of the hot-button issues of recent times, that of artificial intelligence and how it is infiltrating our everyday lives. It's no secret that AI has been around for many years, and despite the relatively recent launch of Chat, GPT and Google's Bed, we've all been interacting with AI systems for quite some time now, through our smartphones and smart speakers at home and in our offices. But like any technology, there are positives and negatives to how it's used and how it might be able to help us. I sat down with tech entrepreneur Joe Nigro, who's based in southeastern Connecticut, to talk about his history with AI, the benefits and the companies he's built using it, and what it means for the rest of us. It's nice of you to join us on uh, Connecticut East this week, Joe, and we're going to be talking about something which is a real hot button issue. Mm Mm-hmm. For all the good and all the negative reasons, because it gets lots of you know positive publicity, gets gets lots of negative publicity, and we're talking artificial intelligence. That's right. Now, just before we get into the whole concept of what this all is, just give us a quick elevator pitch. Who is Joe Nigro? I am an entrepreneur at heart. I love building things, mostly internet businesses. Uh, that's what I've done my whole career up to date. I have spent most of my career building companies that you know, help folks, whether it be find new job opportunities, help people take care of their loved ones, find instant solutions to taking care of home service needs, to most recently, you know, trying to troubleshoot and fix old broken down home appliances and electronics and PCs. And so, you know, that's who I am, really believe that, you know, I have the my finger on the pulse of lots of consumers out there, lots of people that have problems out there that I want to solve by building companies. And that's really who I am. What got you interested in the tech and the artificial intelligence space? Because that's very specific. Yeah, it is. You know, the, the interesting thing is, is I like to tell people, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, built over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Artificial intelligence has been around for quite a while. It's come in different forms. So all of these internet businesses that I've been a part of for many years now have always had this sort of lining of artificial intelligence in the current product stack on the engineering side of things for many years. So this is nothing new per se. What is new is it's being brought out directly to the consumer, interfacing in a simple, seamless user experience that you can use, i.e. BARD or uh, ChatGPT. And so, you know, the, the cool thing about where we were with artificial intelligence and to where we are today is that the artificial intelligence, specifically generative artificial intelligence, is really all driven off of our usage, the people listening to this podcast right now, the more people that use BARD, ChatGPT, and other products and services that are going to be coming out and that are coming out every single day now, is that it requires us to use it. It requires us to be players to kind of come in and, and help the overall kind of community and team and product and efficacy of the tool to, to really drive a lot of value for all of us in many different ways. And so that's the neat thing um, of kind of where we are. But ultimately, Artificial intelligence has been around for many, many years. I've introduced it into all my different businesses prior, currently, and will do in the future. And, and now it's just it's going out to the consumers for all basically benefit. But what specifically got you interested in that? Because, I mean, you know, we all have, so like when we're younger, we all have passions and interests and things. And sometimes it's driven either by family members or it's something that we've experienced or seen. Can you, you know, take yourself back? When did you get interested in this whole, as you say, artificial intelligence? Because it's been around, I think, like as far as back as the 40s. Yeah, it's been around for a long time. It's pretty neat, actually. Um, It empowers people. It empowers people that are building companies. It empowers the end users. And why that matters to me is that anything that's driving value back to the people that 
are trying to garner that value is what I like to be spending my time around. And so for many years, artificial intelligence has been around adding tremendous amounts of value to lots of different people unbeknownst to them. And so for me in, in businesses like on-demand home services, being able to schedule bookings within certain parameters of a zip code, knowing that certain home service providers will show up instantaneously based on the, the mappage that we have, the APIs that we're connected to. Basically, the, the connective tissue of those local areas, zip codes, and service providers are all driven off of this high-efficacy AI that allows us to get very intelligent about where we're placing certain people and why, based on ratings, based on price, based on availability. That's just one simple example. Same goes for elderly care, you know, making sure that we have the best people for the right price to go into your home to take care of one of your loved ones. You know, this is not uh, an easy task, but with artificial intelligence in all various capacities, that allows us to expedite that service and that experience to the end user in a really high efficacy way that you couldn't do without, you know, AI. And you could theoretically write custom lines of code, spend months and months and months of time and bandwidth trying to perfect the exact experience you want. But ultimately, what makes AI really powerful is that it really does sort of take a village to be able to create this incredible experience. And AI is taking in tremendous amounts of outside engagement and data points to allow that amazing experience to kind of get put through to you in any sort of experience that you have in a native app or a service that you're using. And similarly, in and sort of this, this new troubleshooting company I've been working on, you know, ultimately what this is doing is it's, it's taking in tremendous amounts of data that exists on physical and digital manuals that are hundreds of pages long. And we're training the AI to learn these manuals. And then we're essentially displaying that in these seamless, simple steps, all through text message at the moment, for anybody to basically help fix their own Samsung dishwasher if it's overflowing, or your microwave if the light isn't turning on properly, or your coffee pot. There's so many different things inside your home. And what we're noticing with the power of AI is that it spans the reach of just being able to sort of troubleshoot for that user. What we're also noticing is that it's applicable for repair companies across the United States that want to unlock these opportunities of being able to go to somebody's home and fix their customer's problem on the spot. And so, you know, our technology is essentially powering them to do that at a higher success rate, right on the spot. And it's, it's pretty wild how people are using it. It's pretty wild how people are sort of using AI in general to kind of power their own lives in many respects. And to me, that's, that's what's so exciting. And that's why I've been involved with this for, for quite some time now. Uh, and now it's really coming out sort of uh, to the masses, which is exciting. So it comes from um, it's like a, a history of just basically wanting to help people and get, to the, and get to the root of the problem and, and provide, you know, a very good tool for them to do that. And technology does that. You know, technology is the facilitator of, of being able to help not just one individual, but billions of people. And that's the, the really neat thing about, you know, building technology businesses. And it's why we all should be empowering each other to be building businesses, whether it's offline or online. But the, the AI is really kind of allowing lots of entrepreneurs, technology entrepreneurs specifically, to sort of, you know, empower billions and billions of people with these products and services that they're building on the tops of some of this really impressive AI technology. Before we get into this a little bit more, we're obviously reading up on you and uh, a very interesting background you have, of course, and the companies that you have started and subsequently have been acquired by other organizations. We can talk about that in a bit. But there was a lovely little finishing line on your bio which said he likes to tend his tomato garden. What's that about? <laughs> I love gardening, specifically tomatoes. I've been doing this for many years now. I'm very passionate about it and very competitive with it as well. It's, it's something that takes me away from all the activity and in building internet businesses and brings me back to, to real earth. And it's, it's a great thing that I have as a little hobby, as well as photography, and I'm a big tennis player. And so those things keep me occupied and, and ultimately keep me out of trouble. But the tomato game for me is, is huge. I'll have to give you some and you can tell me what you think. But I grew up in a family, an Italian-American family, my grandparents immigrants from Italy, and grew up around a kitchen table, grew up underneath the kitchen table. <laughs> my grandmother was cooking, my mother was cooking, grabbing anything that, that fell on the floor, as well as was fed very well, learned the, the art of cooking at a very young age, and the appreciation of being able to get a family around a table and, and enjoy a really 
amazing meal, create a lot of amazing memories. And so that's sort of where all the, the passion from gardening comes from, is making sure those tomatoes are really good for, for my own family and being able to make those memories as well. Let's talk about some of the companies that uh, you have uh, created and, as we said, subsequently have been acquired. Some of them were very personal when you created them, like the healthcare one. Talk to us about that because it's a great story and, you know, it, there was a very good reason why you felt so compelled to create that company. Yeah, you know, it's a company that I still believe is very important to this day. The idea conceptually was people are being charged tremendous amounts of money for home care health. And when I saw my own grandparents go through this, my mother, you know, and I saw what she was going through and how much things cost to take care of her parents, my grandparents, was extraordinary. And then you start thinking about other families out there that are trying to afford to take care of their loved ones. And immediately my mind, as well as with a few other people at the organization, start thinking to themselves, well, boy, technology can solve this problem, like I alluded to earlier. And it hit so hard to home because when you start seeing these dollars add up and the costs add up, but what you don't necessarily see is the quality of care and the smiles on the people that you love. And, you know, it's a very difficult problem that I think anybody really truly wants to try and solve. I was very lucky at the time to have the tools to be able to solve it and, and did that with incredible people and, you know, very proud of that business. But, you know, the, the ultimate kind of takeaway from that, that company was it started off with a very personal problem, right? Wanting to make sure that, you know, grandparents everywhere and families everywhere had an affordable option to take care of their loved ones, knowing the costs and the business and the industry and the sector and how much money is involved in that space. And then take that, build technology to make that process incredibly efficient, cut the costs by more than half, make the experience for families much more efficient, much more engaging, just better all around. And one other angle to this that I'm really proud of, and I'm proud of for all my businesses, is creating an opportunity for these caregivers to make extra income. In all the kind of themes of these businesses that I've created, the thought has always been, how can we unlock opportunities for the service providers that want to create the job opportunities? And so this obviously became such an awesome business, very successful and really proud of it. And so that's how it all kind of kicked off from personal problem and use technology to help kind of solve it. Another one of the businesses that you created and again subsequently was acquired, enabled users to book cleaners, plumbers, handymen, other household service providers, and then was ultimately acquired by a name that we all know. They have actually changed their name recently. It was called Angie's List, now called Angie. What's it like when you build these? Because I'm guessing you're not building them necessarily. I'm assuming on the basis of, oh, somebody's going to buy it, or maybe you are. But then when that does happen, somebody like this comes along, and you think, okay, that's great. Is it easy to hand over your baby to us like a, a, a big company? Well, you know, I think half the battle is knowing what you're great at, and the other half is knowing what you're not great at. And over the years, you know, I've, I've recognized what I'm great at, and I'm, I'm recognized that I'm great at creating a vision. I'm great at recruiting the best talent in the world, and I'm really great at raising capital to help these ideas come to fruition. And so those are the three main points that I go into every venture thinking about. I don't think about selling the business. I don't think about, you know, if the business fails. I don't think about if customers are going to want it. What I think about ultimately is how can we come together and build a really high quality product or service and give it to people to use to benefit themselves. Like that is where it starts for me. On-demand home services many years back was sort of came off the backs of this on-demand Uberization of lots of different services out there. And so we were in a very competitive, exciting market and time and technology. And so, you know, similarly to kind of thinking about home care industry, the home services industry is another prime example of just inefficiency. It's not easy for the consumers to be able to find high quality service providers instantaneously, book them, pay them, communicate with them. And like I said earlier, the other side of this is 
the people that are working, that want to unlock opportunities, want to unlock more money in their pockets on a weekly basis. And so to me, when I look at the home service industry, that business was a natural fit for a company like Angie to want to acquire. But for us at the organization level, it was a really powerful moment in time where we were sort of breaking through the traditional normal culture of what a home service company should act and look like. We were digitizing that. We were taking the offline home service world and we were digitizing it on your smartphone. And we were one of the first companies to do it. And that came with a lot of exciting times and it came with a lot of really difficult times. But ultimately, we, we saw it through. We built a, a really incredible company with a lot of amazing people and investors and support. And yeah, it was a hell of a run. Technology, of course, can have its positives. It can also have its negatives. I just want to raise one point with you. You have a blog, and one of the blog articles that you wrote was called The AI Movement, Unleashing the Decade of Abundance Mm -hmm. for All of Humankind. What did you mean by that? So as I alluded to earlier about sort of the Uberization of home services or services in general 10, 15 years ago, what people forget is the only way it got there is through the iPhone moment. The iPhone moment to most was was sort of shoo-shooed. It was dismissed. I'm like, this will never work. And if you go back in time and watch some of these YouTube videos of, of people saying this expensive piece of hardware, no one's ever going to use it. There's a thing called a BlackBerry or a flip phone, and we just don't need this. Why that's an important moment is that that is what the platform we all entrepreneurs now are generally building on top of. It's incredibly powerful. At that moment in time, if you stood there and said to yourself, this is the moment of abundance where anybody and everybody do anything they want from a smartphone, you would be in awe of that moment in time. And so what I'm referring to here as AI is this next moment of abundance is very similar to the iPhone movement. We now have the technological capabilities to impact billions of people with all different products and services using AI. And this allows consumers, end users, lots of people out there to benefit from this really incredible technology in various ways. And and that's really what I'm referring to when I say abundance. It really sort of evens the playing field for lots of people out there, whether it's in their home life, their work life, in so many different ways. And I think we'll look back 10 to 15 years from now and say, wow, this is incredible what this piece of technology has allowed us to achieve in, in many different verticals, in many different ways in life. And so that's what I'm referring to by sort of the abundance. And more specifically, you know, you think about troubleshooting old home appliances or electronics or PCs. Being able to instantaneously do that with a service, that's really incredible. Being able to book travel instantaneously in an intelligent way for the price that you want to pay at the destination that you want to arrive at, at the time you want to arrive at, with the people you want to arrive at. These things seem easy and obvious and natural. They're, very, they're not, you know, and AI really allows you to achieve these things as, as well as healthcare. The healthcare industry is going to be completely wide open for innovation for lots of entrepreneurs out there that want to be building businesses to help serve patients. And AI is going to power that. AI does have a little bit of a public relations image, though, doesn't it? And that's sort of, really, I suppose that's down to the media industry and obviously it's like fanciful films which, you know, show AI as taking over the world and we'll all lose out to the machines. I mean, what is the reality? I mean, because AI is powerful, but it's not sentient, is it? It's not. And I've been a proponent of government getting involved right out the gate, just like lots of business leaders. And I think it's, it's important, more so for just the education. You know, I think one of the best skills one could have in this world is just is really just being very curious. Curiosity is incredibly powerful. And I think our you know, political figures should be very curious about AI. I also think, look, anything new comes with a, you know, a healthy dose of skepticism. That's natural. And I, I applaud that. I think that's great. But I think people need to educate themselves. I think they need to learn. I think they need to be curious about what this technology is and how it can help them, how it can hurt them. But I sit in the camp of how it can empower them, how it can open up opportunities that they never had before. And that's what I always want to kind of educate people on and push people to start looking into is this is a tool that can be beneficial to you in many different ways. But the first step is to try it, to use it, to learn about it, to ask questions. And, and that's what I hope you know, our political figures sort of do as well. And it seems like initially they're making those, those strides, but we'll see uh, what they take with it. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, the, the real sort of terminology for AI specifically that I'm spending a lot of time you know, building and getting involved with is generative AI. That's the, the real sort of term. And why that's important to note is this technology means absolutely nothing if people don't use it. 
Because remember, generative AI, and AI specifically, is only as good as the amount of people that are engaging with it. And so this is what unlocks this just incredible potential. And so it really does fall in the hands of real humans that can help take this technology to the next phase. And if people don't use it, if people are made to be afraid of it, if people are told not to use it, are incredibly skeptical of it, and are reading articles about how bad AI is and how it's going to take over all the jobs and everything, which is not the case, doesn't help the future. Uh, I believe it, it creates this stagnant environment that is not effective for anyone. And, you know, that's the optimist in me as an entrepreneur, naturally, but... Uh, that's what I believe. Final question to you, and we've only just scratched the surface, obviously, of this huge, great big topic. What do you see happening in about the next five years in the on the AI front? Well, I see a lot. I see that there's a great example I go back to around people way back in the day when refrigeration, cold storage refrigeration was created and invented. That individual that created it made an impact. You could store things in a cold fridge and keep that for a long shelf life. The people and business specifically that made a tremendous impact for many decades to come and still were the Coca-Colas. And so what I mean by that is platforms that are going to be built in AI, i.e. the refrigeration, cold storage refrigeration, those are being built right now. They call those large language models. And, And why that's important to note is As these large language models get built over time, there will be incredible products and services built on top of them, similarly to the Coca-Colas that have to leverage the cold storage. This is going to benefit millions and millions and millions and millions of people all over the world for products and services. So, So my bet, and what I think is going to occur, is these large language models will get dispersed into the environment and people will start using them and building businesses on top of them. Therefore, it's going to impact, in a positive way, end users, consumers. I think that's when you see the inflection point of this next aha moment, right? This, this, this moment of abundance where it's the next platform. It's the next iPhone app store, per se, where you're able to kind of build companies on top of these large language models. You're able to benefit from these, these products and services that are being built on top of these large language models. It, it just creates just an incredible amount of opportunities for so many different people. It's been great talking to you. As I say, we've only just really touched the tip of the iceberg on this particular matter. And it's great to hear, you know, what AI is about to be educated, uh, you know, by an expert like yourself and to understand that it is there for us, um, you know, if we choose to like reach out, use it. And uh, it does have a lot of positive impacts. Joe, a Nigro entrepreneur, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. To find out more about Joe Nigro and read his blog articles, visit his website at MaslowCap, that's M-A-S-L-O-W-C-A-P dot com. Ma, is this how you feed a hamster? Uh, I think so. Is my homework right? Hmm, I think so. Is uh, this milk still good? Uh, I think so. When it comes to parenting, sometimes it's okay to think you know. But when it's something as important as your child's car seat, don't just think. No. Double check if your child is in the right seat for their age and size. It'll help protect them in a car crash. Don't just think. No. By visiting NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. A message from NHTSA and the Ad Council. It's hurricane season, and your trees can be damaged by high winds. Green Valley Tree has you covered with our emergency tree service outside of our regular business hours. We offer emergency tree service by bucket, crane, and climbing for residential, commercial, and even municipalities across eastern Connecticut. From full tree removals, uprooted or broken trees, to broken, hung up, or fractured tree limbs. Call our emergency hotline on 860-966-5710 or visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com time now for a look at other stories making the headlines this week sponsored by when you face cancer you deserve to be treated by leading experts in a caring and personalized manner at eastern connecticut hematology and oncology or echo we pride ourselves on getting to know each patient and going the extra mile to deliver outstanding care whether you're visiting our doctors getting an infusion doing lab work or spending time with our support team. We treat you like family. See what our patients say at echoassociates.org slash family. 
A Connecticut group submitted a resolution to Hartford City Council recently looking to create better health equity at local hospitals and clinics in the state for immigrants. Edwin J. Vieira from the Connecticut News Service reports. Make the Road Connecticut's resolution asks the council to work with community health providers to guide them on how to supply better services for the city's immigrant community. In Connecticut, 22% of residents age 5 and older speak a language other than English, according to U.S. Census data. Bridget Rivera with Make the Road Connecticut describes some goals of this resolution's passage. It's a vision to ensure health care services are of quality and accessible. It's definitely just a start of ongoing conversations that we wish to have. And it really should signify to hospitals and clinics that this really does matter to the people. Presenting this resolution is just one of several other health-related initiatives that have been going on in the state. Earlier this year, the Husky for Immigrants Coalition introduced legislation to expand the state's Medicaid program to undocumented people up to age 26. However, the General Assembly only expanded access to undocumented children up to age 15 in the state's budget negotiations. I'm Edwin J. Vieira. Lawrence and Memorial Hospital in New London has named their new president. He's Richard Lisitano, and he took over the reins recently from outgoing hospital president Patrick Green, who accepted a position at UF Health in Jacksonville. Lisitano has been senior vice president of operations at Yale New Haven Hospital since 2021 and has been employed at YNHH since 1986 when he started as assistant director of pharmacy. He holds a Master of Science from Ohio State University and a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy from the University of Connecticut. I'm honoured to have been selected to lead and work alongside the staff at Lawrence and Memorial and Westerly Hospital, said Lisitano. I look forward to partnering with employees, the physicians and our community partners to enhance the health of the communities we serve. Governor Lamont announced recently that he has signed a series of bills approved by the Connecticut General Assembly during the recently adjourned legislative session that enact new laws further protecting reproductive rights in Connecticut, ensuring that women in the state can continue making their own medical decisions regarding abortion and contraception in the aftermath of the U.S. Supreme Court's reversal of Roe v. Wade. The governor explained that while other states are passing new laws restricting these rights, elected officials in Connecticut remain firmly committed to ensuring that reproductive health care remains safe, legal and accessible for all who need it. The laws cover protecting medical providers from adverse actions taken by another state, allowing pharmacists to prescribe birth control, increasing access to reproductive care by college students at public institutions of higher education, and protecting the privacy of patient health data online. In the day this week, ATVs, dirt bikes and mini motorcycles will be banned from Norwich city streets when an ordinance approved unanimously by the city council takes effect at the end of July. It bans ATVs, dirt bikes and mini motorcycles from any property owned, leased or controlled by the city, specifically and especially on public streets, highways, recreation areas, sidewalks and in any public spaces thereby preventing damage to flora and fauna and to hiking trails, stonewalks and other physical features of the city's parks, public places and streets. Riders must stop if signalled by any law enforcement officer to do so. Police could seize the vehicle and could auction it if a person cannot prove ownership within 48 hours. The ordinance authorises a fine of $100 for the first offence, $250 $250 for a second violation and $500 for third or subsequent violations. The operator or owner could also be held liable for any damage to trees, shrubs, lawns, crops, fences or any other city property. That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at connecticut-east.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East and on Instagram at Connecticut East This Week. And you can listen to the show again on our social platforms on demand and by asking your smart speaker to play Connecticut East This Week podcast. And please like, follow and share on your social media too. I'm Brian Scott Smith. Thank you for listening. (laughs) 